to the Bloomington Wesley Podcast, BW502, where we look at the intersection of faith and contemporary issues. Each episode, we'll look at topics suggested by Wesley's young adults through the lens of scripture. Today's episode is called Conversations About Body Image. Our scripture comes from 1st Matthew, or 1st Samuel, the story of David. Joining us in the studio this morning are Pastor Sarah Isbell and Jennifer Shotland, MSW. Good morning to you both, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Andy. Good to be with you as well. Jen, I want to thank you for joining me at BW502 this morning. Let me ask you about your work related to body image. Now, you're a school social worker, correct? Yes, I am a school social worker in Woodford County. Okay. And do you see a lot of concern about body image among your students? Absolutely. I work with kids from preschool through eighth grade. With the junior high kids, I see a lot of self-hatred due to poor body image. They aren't big enough, they're too big, they don't have cool clothes or their hair is the wrong texture. I also see a lot of bullying regarding physical features. Um, sorry, um, even vaping is becoming a problem in junior high wing, even down to the fifth graders. And there's definitely a correlation of those that vape and those with low body image. Uh, but it's not just the junior high kids. Um, I see elementary students being bullied about their appearance. We all have, or I'm sorry, we have kids at all ages that skip breakfast and lunch to try to lose weight. And those that do anything they can to get out of PE. There's just so much social, social anxiety about body image. Oh, A couple of startling statistics I recently read, more than one third of five-year-old girls one-third of kindergartner girls restrict their eating in order to stay thin. Little oh kindergartners worried about their weight. Oh. Each month, one million children engage in risky behaviors in an attempt to control their weight. That, to me, is just heartbreaking. Uh, where do these kids get the idea that their bodies are shameful or embarrassing? That's a great question, because, yeah, two-year-olds are not embarrassed or ashamed about their bodies, but it does happen quickly. Media is definitely a factor. All of the images on TV, movies, video games, print ads, those thin, white, beautiful people. We live in a diet culture, a society obsessed with thinness and dieting. Also, um, bullying from other students. What better way to feel better about your own body than to point out other people's flaws? But even more so are the comments made at home from their parents and other family members. Think about how much family members comment on kids' bodies. You're so big. Or, Whatever, you're growing like a weed. <laughs> so many of our compliments are appearance-based, spreading the message that how you look is what matters. And there are those passive-aggressive comments trying to motivate kids to lose weight. You'd be so much prettier if you lost a little weight. Even the comment, you're not fat, you're beautiful, sends the message that fat is bad, and you cannot be both fat and beautiful. You know, I always thought body image was kind of an issue for adolescent girls, but it sounds like it's for people of all genders and all ages, little bitty kids and adults as well. Definitely. And we so easily pass that lack of acceptance and love of our own bodies to our children and just everyone around us in general. Every negative comment we make about our own appearance reinforces the idea that looks are ever so important. How much money do we all spend on makeup, hair care, exercise equipment and memberships, and even elective plastic surgery? The statistics vary, but I've seen between $100 and $300 per month on just makeup and beauty products the average American woman spends. And 2018 was a record-breaking year for American plastic surgeries, but with COVID, that number has grown even bigger because everybody had time to stay home to recover while they worked from home. And how many of us are trying to lose the COVID-20? <laughs> 
keto, Mediterranean diet, cleanses, detox. Some are good, some are not so good. Now granted, not all of this is a bad thing. Good hygiene, exercise, proper nutrition are good for us. But millions of dollars are spent healing or fixing people to hurt themselves, trying to obtain the perfect body. People use steroids, diet pills, injuries um, from taking on too much, stressing the body too far, depression and anxiety from feeling unworthy and unsatisfactory, and then anorexia and bulimia. I've seen on the media a lot about the rise in rates of type 2 diabetes among children, which is true. But what you don't hear, but is also true, is that there are even more kids that have eating disorders. Mm. And beyond eating disorders, nearly one in three, one in three high school girls and nearly one in six high school boys have disordered eating patterns serious enough to warrant medical help. One study found that one in eight girls, one in eight, have made herself vomit at least once in the past three months. Oh my goodness. These are really, really sobering statistics. So many people so dissatisfied with the way that they look. I mean, I guess if I think about it, just about everybody I know has something about themselves they don't like. I should probably admit that I spend a couple extra dollars every couple months at the hairdressers because I'm not quite ready to deal with turning gray yet. And I could probably see better if I would wear my bifocals all the time, but I don't because I don't like how they look on my face. Yeah, I, I get that. I've, I had laser ablation on my varicose veins a few years back. I vividly remember at my last appointment thinking, Okay, what am I going to do next? Ooh. I saw firsthand how addictive it can be to get that kind of thing done. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with getting any work done, but the attitude of having all these things that we're so dissatisfied with or need to be fixed. But there's so much already that's right with our bodies. We need to put more energy toward acknowledging those too. So I've got a challenge for us this morning. I'd like for all of you to get out your bulletin and a pencil or maybe your phone. Um, and I want you to think about all of the amazing things that you love about your body. What are you thankful for? I'd like to challenge you to find at least five to 10 things. Those of you listening at home, you can do this too. Okay, let's write down some things you're, you're, you love about your body and things that you're thankful for about your body. Pastor Sarah, what's a couple things on your list? Oh, well, um, I like my smile. I've had people tell me that they like my smile, so that's something that I like about myself. And uh, when I go running in the morning, I'm thankful that my legs are strong enough to run. So I give thanks for legs. How about you, Jen? I am thankful for my height. Actually, I wasn't always, but I've grown to appreciate it. I'm six feet tall, for those of you that don't know. Um, but I'm really grateful to, I'm amazed by how our bodies heal. The how we're self-healing. That's for the most part. I just think that's so amazing. It is. I hope you all were able to think of things too. Uh, maybe some of them about how you look, but maybe some of them about how your body works. I, I think maybe we should begin to think of ourselves more in that way, that our value as humans, as, as creatures and creations of God is, is not just our outward appearance, but it's in who we are, right? Today's Bible story, for example, this is where I want to head um, next, tells the story about someone who was chosen, who was selected and affirmed, not because of how they look, but for a completely different reason. Our story comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16, and it's the story about how David became king. Uh, and it was not because of his appearance. So maybe you remember, especially kids, maybe you remember these stories way back, the story of David and Goliath. Do you remember that? Little David beat the great big giant Goliath. But one of the things about that story is little David was so small, he was not able to wear the armor 
that King Saul tried to put on him to protect him from the giant. He had to, to fight Goliath on his own. So today's story happens a couple years after that. David is a little bit older now. And God sends the prophet Samuel to go to David's father's house, Jesse's house, in search of a new king. So Samuel goes and he asks Jesse to, to gather all of his sons and, and Jesse gathers the oldest seven sons and has them all kind of come and present themselves before the prophet Samuel for consideration. And each son as he passes is taller and stronger and more handsome than the one before. But about each son, the Lord says, no, not this one. The scripture says, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. So after the older seven of Jesse's sons have passed by unaffirmed, the prophet Samuel says to Jesse, have you got any more sons? <laughs> and Jesse says, well, just the youngest one out in the pasture watching over the sheep. So they call little David in, and no sooner does David, small and scrawny and sunburned and smelling like a sheep barn, show up in the living room, but Samuel knows he is the one. The Lord does not see as mortals see, God says, for they look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. That's such a powerful message. I wish all the students in my school would see that that they are so worthy for who they are on the inside, not for how they look on the outside. And I wish we all could look at each other that way too. Yeah, agreed. I think all of us get so preoccupied with our mortal bodies, we forget that they're, they're a passing thing. The Apostle Paul called our bodies perishable and even corruptible, which I don't think is the same thing as corrupt. I don't think that our bodies are automatically corrupt. Some Christians, I think, believe that, that, that anything that is physical about us is inherently evil or sinful. It has to be suppressed somehow or even punished. That may be where the extreme modesty culture comes in, right? The belief that who we are as physical beings was maybe a mistake, that who we are as physical beings is somehow shameful. I've been thinking a lot about modesty and the modesty culture these days as a mom of two teenage daughters. <laughs> I'll be honest, I really struggle with it sometimes. On the one hand, they should be able to wear whatever they want, but the styles these days, <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe it's always been this way with each new generation. It's just so different from what we grew up with. I wonder if modesty culture sometimes projects our own discomfort with our own bodies onto other people. Yeah. You shouldn't wear that because it makes me uncomfortable. Oh, wow. You shouldn't wear that because it makes me uncomfortable. That is really insightful. But our bodies aren't evil. I mean, God made us physical creatures on purpose, right? If I remember right, back in Genesis 2, God forms Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth with God's own hands and in God's own image. So almost like God has a body too, right? And in fact, God did take on human form when God came in Jesus. Surely that is a sign of God's regard for our physical selves as well as our spiritual. God chose a human body in the incarnation. So we too are children of God. We are physical beings created in the divine image. The psalmist even says that we are woven together intricately, fearfully and wonderfully made. That makes me feel like I should take care of this body, not because I wanna look like a magazine model, but because it's a precious gift from God. I should care for my body by giving it the things it needs, like good nutrition and medical care and exercise, but not try to make it something it's not. I'm not supposed to look like a Barbie doll or a Kim Kardashian. God made me unique and special and wants me to enjoy this gift, not harm it. 
I agree. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul says to us, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's all of us. I think all of us are potential dwelling places for God. I don't see how that could be possible if our bodies were totally corrupt. After all, when God made us, remember, God called humankind very good. It was not until that snake, that serpent showed up and started whispering lies in our ears that we began to believe that our bodies were shameful. So God called us very good. Right. And the snake, the devil, made us feel ashamed. Mm Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Right? (laughs) It's a little like we talked about in our previous podcast, BW502, a couple weeks ago. Don't call unclean what God has made clean. Don't call ugly what God has made beautiful. Our ideas of the human body should come from the God who created us, not from magazines and media. And especially not from advertisements and commercials. They're designed to make us feel dissatisfied with what we have so that we spend money on what they're trying to sell. It's no wonder that looking at the people in those photoshopped ads make us feel inadequate. They've invested a lot of money to design ads for that effect. In fact, recent revelations about Facebook and Instagram, other social media, have shown that they have all contributed to this in dramatic and troubling ways. They knew they were contributing with their, with their filters. They had that data right there in front of them that they were contributing to anxiety, depression, self-harming behaviors, but kept doing it anyway because it kept people on the page for longer and earned them more money. You know, that sounds like snake talk to me. (laughs) But the snake does not love us. And the ads do not love us. And the media does not love us. We should listen to the one who does love us, God. The one who created us, knitted us together lovingly. The one who calls us beautiful and beloved, God. As we near the end of our podcast this morning, we want to invite you to reflect on what we've said. Take a few minutes to thank the God who loves you. And thank God for the body that God gave you, for what it can do, for what it helps you feel, for where it can go, the places that you've been together, the ways that it enables you to interact with others, to love, to serve, to give, and to worship. Ask God to help you love your body the way that God loves your body, like like a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then this afternoon, we have another challenge for you. This afternoon or this evening sometime, do something good for your body. Not just something that, that feels good in the moment, right? But something that's truly good for your body. Eat a nourishing meal, take a good walk or a nap, take a warm bath, enjoy a massage, schedule that doctor's appointment you've been putting off, do a little yoga, appreciate your body as a gift from God, not as a liability that keeps you from being happy. And then give thanks. I'd also like to encourage you to make an effort to become part of a bigger movement of learning to love and accept others' bodies too combating fat phobia and body shaming, and remembering our value and worth goes well beyond physical appearance. If you'd like to find out more, there are some resources Ben's going to put up there. Um, There's thebodypositivity.org. The body is not an apology. National Eating Disorders Association.org, Women's Health. And there's also resources for trans and non-binary people that are gradually becoming more available. Um, But a good social worker or counselor or myself can help you find what you need. Thanks for being a good social worker, Jen. We appreciate your help and your support. Thank you. (laughs) 